When MIT moved from Boston to Cambridge in 1916, it built a stunning new campus from the ground up. With a highly visible location facing Boston, a million square feet of brand new classrooms, labs, and offices, and a dome modeled on the Pantheon in Rome, the new MIT made a bold statement to the world about its ambitions and the growing importance of science and technology in society. But what they constructed 100 years ago turned out to be far more than just a building or even a campus. It was an entire ecosystem for innovation, an ecosystem that has proved vital to the development of the modern world. Good morning, welcome to MIT. My name is Andrew Tang. I'll be your tour guide for today. Ready to get started? We'll head across the street then. The main building of MIT, I think, is one of the reasons MIT is the place it is. The buildings came with numbers and they were all connected. They did not have any barriers. One, three, five, seven, nine are on the left, two, four, six, eight are on the right, and 10 is in the middle. And in a certain way, it is a physical embodiment of MIT's core ethos, which is of collaboration and innovation and not having walls separating us. In 1916, we moved over here into Cambridge. So if you kind of see right in the dome, it's inscribed the year it was built, 1916. It's been a tremendously successful 100 years in no small part enabled by the vision they had in creating the main group. We have an incredible record of innovation. The number of companies started by MIT alums is staggering. Our impact in terms of technology is staggering. Our impact in terms of fundamental science is staggering. Since 1945, we've had more Nobel laureates than any other institution in the world. We account for something like 15% of all the Nobel Prizes. We find fresh new ideas coming as a result of the intermingling of disciplines which occur in these buildings. And this is an incredible, happy accident for MIT, but it's no accident. Freeman and Bosworth planned the buildings to create this sort of environment, and they were right. Throughout the history of this campus, the buildings and their connectivity allowed for breakthroughs that would not have happened if the buildings were isolated on their own. When we train biologists and when we train engineers, we train them differently. Yet this whole focus on convergence that MIT has been pioneering is really an opportunity to take these two disciplines that have a lot of differences and overlay them in a way that I think is really powerful. We're producing a new type of bioengineer that's really gonna kind of revolutionize where engineering and life science intersect. We're really using biology in order to do chemistry. We're looking at what exists in our everyday lives and asking, where does that come from? And what does it really cost us on a larger scale, not just in terms of dollars, but what does it mean for our environment to be able to access these materials? And are there ways that we can think about still getting the things that we know make a real difference to quality of life, but being able to get access to those with a much lower environmental burden? If you walked into your home today and looked around, then you have very close to 100% of what you see around you having come from petroleum. We may sit on a sofa, and that sofa, for the most part, is going to be made out of fibers, and those fibers probably came from petroleum originally. Or if we go into the refrigerator, we'll find a plastic container that contains our milk, um, and that plastic also came from petroleum. We'd like to see a future where you walk in and you sit down on your sofa, and it turns out those materials are from biomass, and you walk on your carpet, and those are from biomass. We're taking these teeny tiny cells and we're engineering them. So rather than having them grow and divide, we're asking them to make some specific product that we can then harvest or extract and use to make these uh, final compounds of interest. What we do actually requires that we look at not just chemical engineering and actually not just chemistry or not just biology. It really requires us to look at all of them together. Okay. I think MIT is a great place to do interdisciplinary research. There's something actually about the physical structure of MIT that makes it very easy to connect. You can actually go pretty far from one end of the campus to the other without ever having to go outside. And that turns out to be very useful in the wintertime. But it also means that it's really easy to get access to people in other departments who are really expert at things that you not necessarily are expert at yourself, but it's great to be able to connect with them. 
Everything at MIT happens to be interconnected by hallways and tunnels, all the academic buildings at least. The Infinite Corridor, I believe, is a sixth of a mile long, so it's not infinitely long, but it's a very, very long corridor. Norbert Wiener was a real character around the MIT campus. He had tremendous impact across the board in mathematics. He became one of the most important mathematicians in the world. I think he had a lot of extra nervous energy, and he needed to walk around, and he went over to Building 20, which was this big warehousey building where a lot of his colleagues whom he was collaborating with worked, and he would talk to them, and then he would find his way back to Building 2, and on his way, he would be talking to people. Jerry Wiesner was reputed to have hidden under his desk when Wiener came because he needed to get his work done. When Wiener was coming by, that meant that he would have to spend a half hour or an hour talking about this and that time he didn't have at that moment. But he cared about all these other disciplines and he wandered around and wanted to find out about them and was eager to help. He was very much a humanitarian and he was interested in neurology and he was interested in things that didn't a priori have a direct connection to mathematics. He was interested in machines and computing, which almost essentially didn't exist at that point, but really it amounted to electronics. He also anticipated questions having to do with signal processing. He was interested in things like radar, and he was interested in going all the way from the simple-minded questions which were related to things like controlling armaments in World War I to using these things to understand signals that, that people send to each other. People associate Norbert Wiener to cybernetics absolutely fairly since he's the person who invented the word. He conceived of it as mechanical things in service of people. Things like mechanical arms, it was the idea of the machine-aided person and, you know, also robots that would do hard things for us that we couldn't do for ourselves. Norbert Wiener embodied the Institute and the notion that we at the Institute are supposed to be curious people. He was especially good at that because he had such interdisciplinary interests. And the idea that we're better because we're together in our separate disciplines but next to each other is a crucial thing and it was obviously central for him when he walked around he got to engage not just in mathematics but in all of the subjects that fascinated him and that was very important to him and, and it is one of the reasons why it's fun to come to MIT. I mean we also have a mascot the beaver does he look a little like a beaver? I don't know. I, it's, it's possible. Anyway, he was busy for all that time. <laughs> this is our glass and metal working labs, one of our newer things that we just renovated. Our official school model here is men's at Manis, which means mind in hand. Not only will you learn, but you will do. And that's kind of the way a lot of the classes here are set up. In the 80s and early 90s, I was head of the algorithms group at the Lab for Computer Science. I was a professor of applied mathematics. Tim Berners-Lee, who was running the web consortium then, was down the hall. And that was one of the nice things about the Lab for Computer Science is, you know, your, your building mates and your hall mates are, you know, really uh, great experts in, in different fields. And uh, the chance to collaborate with them leads to very interesting outcomes. And Tim was concerned then about web congestion. You know, this is really before the web took off, but his concern was the idea of a centralized website and everybody trying to go there to get information would lead to a flash crowd or a hot spot. And it didn't take long to plant the seed that, hey, this could be a useful thing to work on. Danny Lewin came to MIT and joined my group in 96. Brilliant fellow. And we really started thinking about some of these algorithms for how do you make the web work better. It was a collection of algorithms for storing and distributing web content effectively. Instead of putting a website just in one place or maybe two places and directing all the end users to go there to get the web page or the content, actually storing that content in thousands of places in an on-demand way. The more people that want it, the more places it's stored. It was fundamentally different and it really worked. None of us had any clue about business. We met venture capitalists, we met industry experts. 
And so we bit the bullet and started a company in the uh, fall of 98. We got our first customers in early 1999. We grew very rapidly after that. And then the bubble burst. A lot of the customers went broke. So we had to do massive layoffs. And by far the worst of all, Danny was killed on September 11th. He was on the first jet that went into the World Trade Center. It was devastating to all of us. Uh, you know, he was just an incredible human being, a great leader, uh, you know, the kind of person you just want to follow anywhere. Today, we're a highly profitable business growing rapidly. This spinning globe here shows the cities where we have servers located. When you see a big spike coming out, that means we got a lot of capacity. We carry a pretty sizable portion of the web traffic around the world. Right now, you can see we're delivering over uh, 20 terabits a second. That's 20 million megabits per second of content. And we're doing about 40 million deliveries every second. Akamai certainly would not have happened without MIT. Wouldn't have happened without the lab for computer science and the environment there. The students and the faculty gravitate towards solving really hard problems that seem impossible. And then you have so many technologists from different disciplines at MIT. A chance to interact and go across boundaries. There are ties to multiple different departments to do cross-disciplinary research. And that's the accepted practice. It's normal to do that. You know, I could be working on computer science in the math department. That's the point of the architecture, is that it puts people together and it makes it easier for them to interact. There's nothing that separates us, so you can walk from a material sciences office and two doors down you're running into one of our music professors. It's all seamless, we're all connected, we're all one. So that creates an environment of interdisciplinarity, it creates an environment in which there are no barriers, it creates one culture. And there's just that constant flow of knowledge just going all the way through all the different hallways. It's what brings us together, in a sense, physically and in terms of just as a community in general. The building captures what I love most about MIT, which is that it requires you to be open-minded. It requires you to have to talk to people who you may not otherwise talk to. The folks that study organizations and culture, they'll tell you very quickly that if you grow tall and thin, you're unlikely to collaborate from one floor above and one floor below, right? So you're just not going to know them. And I think here is this kind of almost a tower, you put it flat, and you have a not so tall building, but what you have is very connected length. That sets the foundation of how modern scientific and knowledge pursuit occurs. There's something about the main campus that sort of defined MIT. And even though we're now in a different century, these core principles are astonishingly resolute in part of who we are at MIT. We do not have class ranks. We do not have valedictorians, dean's list, honors, or anything like that. When you graduate from MIT, you are just a graduate like anybody else has ever been through the institute. And the reason why is because we believe in teamwork. We believe that teamwork is what truly solves problems. It's not about competition, but about cooperation. As we've added new buildings to the campus, we've tried to maintain that same spirit of interconnectedness that allows for problem solving. Frank Gehry was very sensitive to the corridor, and you know, he was an architect who sort of realized that these spaces aren't leftover spaces or aren't functional spaces. They're educational, pedagogical, social spaces. He saw that in the infinite corridor, and he replicated it to revive the idea of linear indoor spaces. Of course, in his world, it's not linear anymore, but that's even better, perhaps, you know? So I think that was really the key element of the success of that building, Gary's sensibility to the idea of a corridor um, as the, the lifeblood of an institution, and not just as sort of a place you walk as fast as possible from one end to the other. Because we have this hyper-connectivity and this density, our definition of near at MIT is probably different than the definition of near for a lot of other campuses. When you look at the brain and cognitive sciences complex, near was so close to them that they had to build the building to straddle the railroad in order to get everybody near. Now we're being very explicit about identifying the challenges. So having a building is themed around the challenge rather than a building that is built for a specific department. 
And you could think of the Koch Center for Cancer Research as a central example of that. And this, in my mind, is what creates a campus of problem solvers. Because if we're going to solve the great problems that face the world, from clean drinking water, to curing cancer, to climate change, to designing new cities, these problems cannot be confined to one discipline or to one academic building. 